All right. All right, well, let's pray together, and uh, we'll get started tonight. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this evening. Father, that you've brought us together safely to join together, to pray together, Lord God, to study your word together, to see how we can better one another, each other, Lord God. And so I just pray tonight as we look at what it takes to have genuine change, lasting change, Lord God, as we see what it takes to really grow in holiness with you, Father. I just pray tonight you would just open our eyes to the truth, Lord God. Help us to block out whatever distractions may be vying for our attentions and our affections tonight, Lord God. And just to place all of our focus upon you, because it's in you that we trust, Lord God. And so we love you. We praise you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 Well, last week we started something new, talking about how to equip one another to minister to one another. And really the ideal is how to biblical counsel one another. And that may sound intimidating. It may sound uh, uninteresting to some of us here. But the reality is all Christians are supposed to one another, one another. Or one another, each other may sound better, right? We're all supposed to do that. And what we're doing, we're discipling one another and we are truly counseling one another. And that's all of us. Now, some of us do it as a full-time job, right? Uh, but we all, as Christians, are supposed to do it. In fact, we all have to do these things. And biblical counseling is no different than discipleship. It's just real discipleship. That's what biblical counseling is. Now, there are situations, as we've said before, that require someone who's really skilled, someone who's studied, someone who's been equipped thoroughly. There are certain things that need to be handled by someone who is more trained um, in, in these areas, certain areas, PTSD, um, a lot of sexual problems, different things, abuse. I mean, those are hard things. But most situations, you as Christians, we are equipped to handle if we just know and utilize God's Word as it's given to us. Amen? And so, hey, and so uh, this is what we're trying to do. So we're trying to make sure that we can all be equipped. So tonight, as we talk about change and growth, this is more... We will call this foundational work because what we talked about last week, hopefully um, you, if you didn't, if you weren't here, you were able to go back and listen to it. If you haven't, I'd encourage you to go back and listen to it. It just kind of lays the groundwork and gets our minds thinking about how we are to one another, each other. And so it's very important, like tonight, this is groundwork so that when we start dealing with issues of pride, of lust, of anger, um, whatever it might be, even some of the harder things, everything can be tied back to Scripture. And that's not to say that there's never a time when we have to call in um, maybe a trained, uh, and I would always encourage to find someone who's a Christian, first and foremost, but someone who actually counsels from a Christian perspective. Much of what's called Christian counseling today is just Freudianism or Jungianism or some other school of psychology just done by someone who claims to be a Christian. And it's not to say all of that's bad. There are some good things that can be attained uh, therein, but most of that starts with the wrong premise, and it looks the wrong place to find the hope and the help. Uh, most of it is dealing with inward stuff like how to love yourself better and how to forgive yourself and all of those things. But the real root behind those issues is having a proper view of God and having a proper view of humanity. If we can get those two things in order, then the so-called self-love or self-hate and all those things begin to fix themselves. Um, humans don't have a love problem with their self. We, we love ourselves pretty naturally. Um, we need to be trained supernaturally how to have God-like love. I mean, it's you wake up in the morning and, the, I mean, our default mode typically is me. What do I need to do? You know, how much longer can I sleep? You know, all those kind of things. I mean, we're, we're wired naturally uh, from birth because we're steeped in sin at birth uh, to think about number one. So we, we love ourselves more than we really need to. We need to think biblically about ourselves. And that's different. That's different. Our, our, our hope and our, our worth and, 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 I mean, all of us as, as human beings, human dignity comes from the fact that God created us. Um, it has nothing to do with what someone thinks about our clothes or where we, where we live. Or what do we, how do we say it? Uh, it doesn't matter where we stay, you know, that sort of thing. I mean, it's, it's, that was just, you know, my vernacular for where I grew up, okay? But um, what matters is who's our father? And God's not the father of everyone, right? Uh, he's the creator of humanity. But remember what Jesus said, you're of your father the devil, as he talked to the Pharisees even. And so... Um, 
Only those who have been redeemed can call God their Father. Amen? And so we need to realize that, and so that, that's important. Anyway, uh, tonight, let's talk about change. And, um, and, and to do that, I think I can control this from here. Let's see if the screens change. All right, there they go. So we're going to, if something happens, Chrissy, <laughs> I need you to go back there and control the computer, please. But uh, I, think, I think we'll be okay here tonight, like this. So there, there are six phases that, that we go through when we're trying to change. Or not, that's not a good way to say it. For genuine change to take place, there are phases that we go through. Now, let me just say up front, this may not be like um, someone thinking about, you know, the, the five phases of grief. And so you've got denial and anger and all these different phases, and you finally get down here to acceptance. And I'm not talking about step one, step two, step three. We may go through these phases when we try to change. Oftentimes, these things kind of happen together. Some of these may happen at the same time. But all of these things happen for us as we change to become more like Christ. And the reason we're going to talk about this, it's good for us to know. And in fact, if you've been a Christian for a long time, you probably know these things here. But it would be real good for us to get a grip on these truths so that when people are struggling around us, we can pull from our arsenal and we can help them easily without having to go, uh, where's Pastor Kevin's phone number? I mean, again, there are times when you may have to reach out to me or an elder or someone else who's had training, like Corey's done uh, some extensive training. There's some others who have begun their training uh, pathway here for biblical counseling. Uh, there's a few others who may be interested as well. Uh, and if you're interested, get with me. I can talk to you about how to, to uh, go even deeper than what I'm going to share with you. But again, my hope is to equip you as Christians to one another each other biblically, the way we're supposed to. And so, six phases that we go through when genuine change takes place. And so, we're just going to make our way through this. Think of this more as a teaching session than preaching. We're going we're to learn together here. And so, the first phase is the realization phase. And so, one comes to see the truth and understands how it applies to their life. Now, this, this happens to all of us. Now, Everyone, I say all of us, all of us in Christ, this should happen to. Those who aren't in Christ may never get to this realization point. They may refuse and reject the truth. Um, the truth's not in them. But for Christians, for Christians, and those who God is dealing with, we see like in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 and following. Did I write these in your handout? I can't remember. Okay, so 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26. God's Word says this. The Lord's bondservant, and that's the word doulos, which means slave. Okay, so that's a little more strong, strongly worded, but bondservant, slave. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged. Now, let me just pause real quick, because this really kind of goes with what I said this morning. All Christians should be able to teach one another. Amen? We're all supposed to be mature into that level. So just tuck that in your pocket. But he says, verse 25, we're to do this with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition. If perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. And they come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. So that's this realization phase. They, they, they need to be brought to the place where they see what they're doing and they see what the truth is. Any, any of us who have come to a place of repentance... If someone's come alongside of us and, and said, hey, you know, Kevin, um, you know, what you said, that was, that was mm, you know, that, that's probably not the best thing for you to say. That's a little, you know, what, whatever. I mean, just, you know, a risque or that's a little um, abrasive and that's not the best, you know, kind of uh, joking perhaps maybe that, that you should use as a Christian. And, and I mean, I, I could reject that. Obviously, that would be the wrong thing to do. But when I'm confronted with that, you know, and someone may say, the Bible says, let there be no coarse joking, just using that illustration. And all of a sudden you realize, wow, I did not even realize what I was doing. You ever had those kind of moments when, when your sin is brought to your, your, your forefront? Sometimes it doesn't even take someone. Sometimes we sin, and because of God's Spirit in us as Christians, we realize because we're convicted by the Holy Spirit. Oh, I can't believe I just said that. I can't believe I just did this. And, and you're convicted right there. You don't need a Brent to come alongside of you and say, hey boy, or you know, whatever. Sometimes God does it for us. No, but, it, but he does use others to do it as well. But that's that realization phase, and praise God for that. <clears throat> so I forgot to put the scripture up there. Sorry, I'm not used to doing the slides myself here. Um, the second thing is the remorse phase. The remorse phase. 
So you come to feel this godly sorrow in relation to your sin and desire to make things right with God and others accordingly. This isn't just, I'm sorry I got caught, which we've probably all experienced from other people, obviously, right? We would never respond that way, but sometimes we, we might. We're sorry we got caught, but true sorrow, godly sorrow, God, that's remorse. That's biblical remorse. And we see that in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. Now, I apologize if the... Um, I'm learning. I've got a new mic here, and so I'm learning how to use this lapel. So when I look down sometimes, it's getting too loud. So just know that's what it is. I'm trying to get used to where I need to place my head. But this is a lot clearer than that earpiece we've been using. There was just something going on with that thing. So I, I, I can hear this better. Can y'all? Is this, this better? Okay, good. It's, it's a lot clearer. Um, but anyway, so, so 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, For sorrow that is according to the will of God produces repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. And we don't want to have worldly sorrow. It's not real sorrow. It's not valuable sorrow. It's not helpful at all. Again, it's just the, oh no, I got caught, so I got to try to cover my tracks here. That's that kind of sorrow. That's not biblical sorrow. We're talking about repentance. We're talking about godly sorrow, and, and it brings repentance, and, and it leads to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. Now, think about this for a second. When we see the word salvation, we probably automatically go to what kind of ideal of that word? Being saved from our sins. So maybe justification. The word salvation doesn't only mean and doesn't always mean in Scripture just being saved from our sins in order to be justified, like that first time. Like, it's not that, you know, okay, so this is only for a lost person because it leads them to salvation. No, salvation can be used also that it's, 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 it's removing that sin from us, even in, our, even in our saved state. We're being sanctified. We're being made more holy. So that's, that aspect's a reality too. So, so don't just push this aside because of that aspect of salvation. It can mean the other thing. And so that brings us to the third phase, the renouncing phase. One comes to confess their sin to God and to others when appropriate. And so think about, think about this passage. <clears throat> How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silence about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away uh, as with the fever heat of summer. Selah, he says. Verse 5, I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Selah. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely, in a flood of great waters, they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. Selah. I will instruct you <clears throat> and teach you in the way which you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be as the horse or as the mute which have no understanding, whose trappings include bit and bridle to hold them in check. Otherwise, they will not come near to you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked. This is long, but let's, let's continue. We're almost to the end of it. He says, But he who trusts in the Lord, loving kindness shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones, and shout for joy, all you who are upright in heart. Now this is a tremendous psalm that speaks about our repentance and our remorse. Our, our, and, and the renouncing. He confesses. He, he renounces his sin before the Lord. And there's peace that comes upon him. Giving it to God. That's not just a catchy phrase. Oh, just give it to God. Now, sometimes we use it that way, and we use it probably inappropriately. Um, and you see this a lot of times in some of the extremities of Christianity. Um, you think about more on the, on the more hyper-charismatic side. Everything's kind of cliche and shallow oftentimes. And I don't 
I'm not trying to be despairing, um, but, but that is the tendency. But then if you get too far over into the, the real hyper-Calvinistic uh, uh, side, everything's about the sovereignty of God, and, oh, if God brought you to it, he'll bring you through it. And we kind of have that kind of thing. And, and the reality is that there's somewhere in the middle, there's this balance between God's sovereignty and our responsibility, what he expects out of us. Amen? I mean, he does expect for us to do things. And so when we're faced with our sin, there should be this realization, this remorse, this renouncing of the sin. As, as James chapter 5, verse 16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Now, oftentimes, again, more on the far extremes of the charismatic circles, every verse about healing has to do with physical healing. So you've got, a, you've got strep throat. Well, you need to confess your sins and, and the Lord will heal you from that physical ailment. That's not what's in view here. And the, 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 what's in view is our soul being healed, our sinful estate being healed. And so that's the idea. We see that in the Psalms as well, um, this idea that, that Jesus' death brings healing to us, but it's healing us of our sin. It's restoring our soul. Again, Psalm 23, we kind of mentioned this morning. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Right? What, what does the shepherd do? He leads us beside still waters, right? He, 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 he restores us. He restores our soul. He, this is what God does. And so, so when we renounce our sin, it leads us then to this next phase here. And again, Maybe there's not succinct areas where you see that was phase two. Okay, I've got to get to phase three. But all of these things really are taking place. And when you are talking with a friend or a family member, maybe a child or a spouse or, or, or just a co-worker who's, who's going through something, you may be able, as you study and as you, as you search the scriptures and as you kind of review some of these topics that we're talking about, you may, you may discover real quick that they're kind of hung up in one of these areas. And you, you know because there's six of these, you've got to help them maneuver through these, these, these processes so that they can truly be healed of their sickness, the sin sickness, amen? And so you renounce that and it brings us to repentance where one comes to turn away from their sin towards God and towards others accordingly. And so it's not just turning away, there's also the turning to. And this really kind of speaks to Ephesians 4 that we looked at last week, where you put off sin, right? You change your thinking. You put on godly habits and attributes. There has to be that replacement. It's not enough to, to stop... Um, well, give me, I'm just trying to think of a, a, a sin, one that's okay to talk about, right? Um, it's not enough to stop getting drunk. Let's use that. We need to not just stop getting drunk. We need to find fulfillment and find... Um, um, what, 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 what is it? Help me out here. We need, to, we need to find satisfaction, not in how that made us feel, but we need to find our satisfaction in Christ and in what He's done for us, F whether we feel great about it or not at those times. You don't, you, you, does that make sense? Maybe that wasn't the best analogy, but, but it's a letting go of putting off and then replacing it with something. And that's what repentance is. You turn, you turn from your sin to God. You turn from your sin to to God. Both of those are necessary. So often it's just about, okay, I repent of my sin. But you never really turn to God. Not, not you per se, but, but people. And what happens 10 days later? Guess what they're doing? They're doing the same thing again. I mean, I've been there. Have you? It happens so often to us over and over again. We have to truly, fully repent. So away, put off, come to God. We put on. And we'll talk more about that as we make our way through here. But repentance, Proverbs um, 28 verse 13 says, He who conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will find compassion. That's God's word to us. And, and we see in 2 Corinthians 7 verses 10 and 11. Am I going too fast? Okay. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 7 verses 10 and 11 says, for the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. For behold, what earnestness this very thing, this godly sorrow has produced in you, what vindication of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what avenging of wrong. In everything you demonstrated yourselves to be innocent in the matter. That's repentance. You... You, you not just feel bad, but you have true remorse and you turn to God. 
That's repentance. That's something we have to wrestle with every single day as Christians. We never, I don't think we will ever, in fact, I know we will never, because I've never met anybody who's ever been completely glorified in this body, in this life, without going to heaven. Have you? Have you met anybody who's perfect? I don't know. Don't look up here. <laughs> and don't look around either. Who? Uh, Joyce Myers claims that. You, you say that jokingly, I know. She has claimed many times that she's perfect already, that you know she's a saint, and which she is a saint, but, but she's not yet perfect. There, there's a false view of perfectionism here, and we, we will not be fully perfect until glory. In fact, the very, the very I have to say it now, the, the very thoughts, and especially once we say it, when we verbalize that thought that we're perfect and we don't need to ever repent again, that's pride. That's a sin that needs to be repented of right there. And so we have to remember that and, and, and not be captivated by some of the, the chicanery, some of the, the smooth talk even of some of these, these so-called preachers and teachers across the airways. We have to go to the Word, test everything against the Scripture. And, and I'll say it again. Uh, Pete mentioned this. It's something I try to remind you all often. Uh, he mentioned this when he preached last. Don't trust me. Now let me qualify that. Test what I say against the Word. I can make mistakes. I have before. I probably will again. I don't want to. I'm not trying to. But it's probably going to happen. Um, because, again, not to use this as, a, as an excuse, but I'm human just like you are. We're all apt to make mistakes. Amen? And so, but here, here's the thing. When, when we're shown our error, the error of our way, we have to realize, then we remorse, we renounce it, we repent of it, and then that brings us to renewal. This is, you know, we turn away. Now this renewal is the turning to part, if you think about it that way, just in view of the repentance. Renewal phase comes to, um, <clears throat> one comes to meditate on the truth so that he or she may learn the new direction by which they are to obey God and love others accordingly. Listen, if I'm not loving people the way I'm supposed to, don't try, don't, let, me, let me say it this way. If, if I'm not loving other people the way I'm supposed to, you know that I don't love God the way I should. These go together. Someone who claims to love God but doesn't love his brother or sister, they don't really love God the way they're supposed to. Amen? I mean, that's, that's the reality here. So, so, so if I'm going to obey God, I'm going to treat others accordingly. That's the idea behind this renewal aspect. And, and we need to be counseled on this. And sadly, if you're hard-headed like me, you have to be reminded of this all the time. Because sometimes, let's just face it, sometimes people get on your nerves, right? I mean, that's, I figured somebody would amen. No, nobody, that's just me. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Gary and I, all right, Gary and I will repent here after we're done tonight. But it's been a while. Of course, yeah, it's been a while for me. Uh, I've, you know, I've kind of got it together now. And, um, no, okay, all right. <laughs> you get on your own nerves? Yeah, I get on my nerves too. That's a unique, unique that's a unique gift. That's my spiritual gift. It's not, a, it's not the good spirit, obviously. But um, anyway, let's get off of that. That's a bad, bad, bad trail to go down. But we, we, have to, we have to be renewed. And so if we truly love God and He is renewing us, it will show in how we treat other people. So this passage here in Ephesians 4, verses 17 through 23. This is in that same thought that we were studying this morning. This is just further into that chapter. Now next Sunday we're going to pick up on verse, uh, what do we get to, 11? We'll look at 12 through 16 next Sunday. And then we're going to be in Romans, talking about the body. But we're going to see, and here I'll just kind of throw it out there, there are two offices that are God-ordained for churches. One is the elders, pastors, teachers, elders, bishops, uh, presbyters, you know, however you want to, 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 whichever name you want to use. But the other office, according to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8 and following, is the office of a deacon. A deacon. And so we're going to talk about that word. That word is loaded. It is. It's a loaded word. It's because it's used prolifically just to talk about how all Christians are to serve. It's, it's just very generic how we all serve. But at, by, the end of Tim, uh, by the end of Paul's life when he's writing to 2 Timothy, he is going back to the ideal of what and it was initiated in Acts chapter 6. And they, they had the, the, the church pick some men to do some day-to-day -day kind of tasks. 
some not menial tasks, I don't want to say it that way, but just some, just some ordinary service kind of things, making sure all the widows of this particular group got fed and had, had food. And they said, we, as the apostles, who, who were also elders of the church, they were the initial elders, but the apostles said, we will focus on the ministry of prayer and the word. And that is not elders per se and deacons per se, but I guarantee you that's the prototype of where the new, rest of the New Testament teaching comes from. That is absolutely the prototype. And so we're going to talk about that word. What's, what's it mean to serve, to deacon? All right? Do you deke? Since we talked about Eldon well this morning, we'll, we'll, next week we're going to talk about deacon. How you deacon? Are you deacon and good? Are you deacon well? I don't know. We'll figure something out. Maybe you can come up with something good. But, but look at this in Ephesians 4.17. He says, So I say this and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind. Now, remember, the Gentiles spoke of non-Jews, but it also just spoke of, of worldliness, worldly people. So it's used in both of those ways. So here, that's the idea of, of more of those who don't know Christ. It's not just that they're not Jews here. The ideal is these are worldly-minded people. So don't walk that way, just as the Gentiles also walk, in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But you did not learn Christ in this way, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as the truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside, here's that put off we talked about earlier, that you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So you're putting off because your mind is changing. And mind here and heart are really synonymous. The inner man, you're thinking differently about sin and about holiness. Does that make sense? And so your mind's being renewed. And then it goes on to say, oh no, that's all. That's all for now. Sorry, verse 23. So you're being renewed in the spirit of your mind. But the other part we're, we're fixing to pick up on here. So just, just hold on. The other part is this, the replacement. That's the putting on, the replacement phase. That's number six. Excuse me. <clears throat> One comes to obey God and love others in the area where he or she had disobeyed God and had been unloving towards others. So again, those go together. So I've done these things. I've, I've put off these areas, right? Now, um, I just realized I have the wrong, the wrong scripture down. I, I copied down that same scripture. Look, if you will, in Ephesians 4, but look at verse 24 now. 24. So he's already said, put off, right? There's that laying aside the old. That's the, we're, 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 we're repenting, we're being renewed, and now we're replacing it with something. He says, now, and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Now, these three verses, verse 23, 24, and 25, this is, I'm trying to think of a good word here. This is priority one. Memorizing. If you want to help people, this is this is some of your this will be the one of the best weapons you use. And it's not that you're using the weapon against them, but you're using the weapon against their their habit, their sin, uh, the pride, the lust, whatever it might be. It's not enough for them just to repent the way we commonly think about repenting. I'm sorry for my sin. It's putting off. It's changing your thinking about it, and then it's putting on the good things. All of that is what biblical repentance really, truthfully entails. All of those things are required. And again, let me just, at, I'm going to repeat myself here. I know this bothers Craig so much when, when people repeat themselves too much, but let me do it at least this one time. So often what we do as Christians is we just say, I'm sorry, God, and we, we ask for forgiveness from our sin, but we never really do anything to feed our mind and change what we're doing. We never put on anything. We don't ever replace it. Does that make sense? So let's just say we have an addicted, uh, we're addicted to you know, item A here. And so we need to change our thinking. Okay, item A is sinful. That's problematic. That, that hurts the heart of Christ when I continue to go after that. That's an idol in my life. I'm thinking about that thing. I want it more than I want God. So our thinking has to change. And so what we decide to do now is, you know, here's, um, here's, here's item B. And we're going to say item B is, is 
more Bible study, more prayer, more fellowship with Christians to fill the void that was left from hanging out with, you know, with uh, Shane and, and all my drinking buddies, or who, just for an example. I mean, again, it's, just, it's not enough just to say, I'm sorry. Oftentimes we stop there and we just, I'm sorry, but nothing changes. Our mind doesn't change about it. We still think about it all the time. We need to fill our mind with something else. PJ and I have talked about this quite often. We have to fill our mind with something else. When, when I was younger, um, before Jesus, uh, before Jesus, we won't talk about everything. My mother's here, okay? So I don't, please don't fill in any of the gaps, mother. Uh, but, but I used to listen to, to certain type of music. And some of you know, I know, um, you know, Brent and Corey know for sure. Shane, Shane knows. My, my, the kind of music that I listened to was kind of that club kind of style music. I, I mean, I graduated in 88, and so um, the new wave kind of thing was, was big. And the, 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 my favorite group back then was The Cure, and I would listen to it all the time. And this was back when there were LPs, before LPs were cool and fashionable again like they are now, right? This was back with the old... Uh, uh, you remember when the dog was, uh, what was that, Mem is it live or is it Memorex? Was that the thing, the old dog with the, with the what's those old Vitrola kind of, I don't even know, it's so long ago, I don't even remember what it's called, but, but this is like during the cassette tape era, okay, you remember cassette tapes, anybody? Yes. Uh, just a few of us here, okay, yikes. Um, so this was after 8-tracks, before CDs, how's that? Does that help? All right, so what's an 8-track? Well, never mind. All right, let's pray, I've, I've dated myself, let me pray and let's go home now. But, but I, I, I would even, I would, I would save my money, and I was working at Kmart during, right before I got saved, and, and shortly thereafter, but I would save my money, and I would import um, European mixes of Cure's, like, extended play albums that weren't available in the United States. I mean, I just, I loved those things. But I would, I would listen to it over and over and over and over and over again. But right after I got saved, I was still doing that. Now, this may be a, a goofy illustration, but just stay with me for a second. And, and hopefully I'll come back and make the point. Hopefully. So, so I'm listening to this over and over. This is what I had been doing before I was saved. I'm still listening to it. But before I was saved, I was going to the clubs where this music was played. Sometimes I was sneaking out. Okay? I think my mom has figured all that stuff out by now. But, but I was doing, you know, going places where I didn't, I didn't need to go. And, and that sometimes involved alcohol. Not always. And, and by that time, honestly, the Lord had kind of really already gotten a hold of me and was, had started dealing with me and was bringing me to repentance. And so that can pretty much started going away already. But all this was involved. So after Jesus, I'm still listening to this music. But guess what would pop up into my head because I'm still listening to the old music that I love that was so much a part of my sinful lifestyle before Jesus. Those sinful habits that I was involved in. All of that stuff was, was coming to mind because now I had confessed Christ, but my thinking had not all changed yet. Does that make sense? And so in order to put that off and keep it off, not only did my thinking about music, music affects us more than we know. And you remember the lyrics of that music. I can still quote probably, I would say probably 75% of the Cure songs that had been produced up until 1990. I bet I could still quote all the lyrics. That's probably not a great thing to brag about, honestly. And that's just, that sounds prideful. I've got to confess that, don't I, Corey? Oh, but, but in order to put that off, I had to replace it with music that glorified God and edified my soul. And, and I'll just be honest. Back in 1988, 89, there wasn't a whole lot of good Christian music back then. All right? I mean, there were hymns and back then. I mean, I wasn't real big on hymns. Uh, I wanted music, you know, that made your foot stomp. And so there were people like DeGarmo and Key and 441, like the number 441. And there were some other groups that had come, uh, Michael W. Smith back then, um, Rich Mullins. I'm dating myself, I know, but this was, this was before Amy Grant got all crazy too. I mean, this is way back uh, at the beginning of, of the kind of the Christian music era. But I had to replace it. Now again, I know that's, that's kind of maybe a weak illustration, but, but it was huge for me because my thinking was suffering because of what I was listening to. But isn't that true for us today still with what we watch and what we hear? If, if, if I, I just tell you, for me, I'm not a fan of rap music. I know some of you like rap music, and that's fine. The style, if, if you like it, that's fine. I'm going to pray for you. Okay? No, it, it's, it's okay. I, th there, are, there are some godly Christian rappers who have some good songs, so I'm told. I haven't heard them yet, personally, but I'm told that. PJ and some others tell me. I know Tyler listens to some of that. Brock, do you? I don't know. Brock's more on the metal side from, from those days, but... But I know they're there. But the, the kind of rap stuff from when I was younger in school, 
was filthy. Filthy. Do you, do you remember? I mean, and it's probably like today. I don't listen to it today. But, but it's not just that rap's filthy. Think about country music lyrics. Country music is just as bad. It just uses different adjectives than rappers do, right? It's not all about your dog and your truck and your ex-wife. It's about a lot more than that, okay? If you just listen, and that's not edifying to us. We have to be careful what comes in. And so that's where this replacement, that's the ideal here of the replacement where it comes in. And so the verse is verse, verse 24 there. Let's move on here. Now, each of these areas, uh, yeah, we, we've got time. Each, each, each of these areas of change, and think about it, if you think about it as phases, and again, someone's not going to walk up to you and go, oh, you know, Brock, I, I'm just really struggling. I, I can't get to the renewal phase of, of this, of this uh, change in my life. Most people have no clue these are kind of the things that we go through. Uh, I, mean, f I mean, how many of you here would you say that a lot of this is kind of new, at least terminology for you? Would you agree? I mean, but to think through these things, we know the concept and the principle, and the words aren't really that important. It's just the idea that these things happen and again, sometimes all at once, but we are all, as we come to repentance, going through these kind of processes. And so we have to realize that, that each of these is worked through in various stages of growth, spiritual growth. And this is what we're going for. And biblical counseling, discipleship, both of them, they are about growing spiritually. It's not about just fixing a problem. It's about, it's about changing a heart. It's about changing thinking, right? It's about putting off, renewing your mind and putting on. This is what we're all to be doing every single moment that we breathe as Christians. That's why I said, said earlier that I don't think anybody here is perfect yet. And I know it's not me. I don't think anybody on this earth is perfect. It's certainly not Joyce Meyer. It, it's, it's, there's no human on this earth right now that's perfect. If we're in Christ, we're being made perfect. And there will be a day in glory where we will be uh, before Him. And I, I see, I'm so excited to think about it. We're going to see Him as He is. We're going to know as we're known. I mean, what, what does that even mean? There's going to be no veil between us. There's just going to be pure, um, I mean, just the presence of God in, in, in pure holiness and perfection. We'll want for nothing. No more tears. No more sorrow. No more sin. Wow. No more longing. I mean, all of, our, all of our wants, well, not our wants, well, I think, yeah, let's say it that way. All of our wants and needs will be met because when we're in glory, our wants will be our needs. Does that make sense? We'll be changed. We won't want for sinful things. We'll want for the glory of God to be manifest in whatever we're doing on, in heaven or on earth, right, or in between. The new Jerusalem, as it, as it seems in um, the book of Revelation, it seems to exist between the new heaven and the new earth fascinating study, but that's for another time. So, so how does this work out then spiritually? Well, think about it this way. Look at uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and verse 13. <clears throat> verse 12 and 13. I'm going to, I may try to pick up the pace here a little bit. So, <clears throat> oh, excuse me. I forgot where my mic was. I went to cover the wrong place. I'm used to it being up here. <clears throat> Sorry, Brandon. I got Bra Brandon. Wake up, Brandon back there. He's awake. All right. So, so, so look at it this way. In, in Philippians chapter 1. I think Pete's actually going to be preaching the next time from Philippians. Is that correct? Is that what you said today? So, so this will be good. Think about this. He says, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed. Now, he's writing to the church in Philippi. He's, he's writing to Christians here. Paul's writing. He says, just, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Where was Paul when he was writing this? He was in prison, so he wasn't with them physically. But he says they're obeying much more in his absence. He says, now, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So, so think about this for a second. God's working inside of us, and we're working outwardly. We're responding. Why do I say that? Well, look at the next verse. Look at verse 13. He says, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to do. Or to work, right? His good pleasure. Both to will and to do. To will and to work for His good pleasure. So, back to the verse 12. What's He want us to do? To work out our salvation with fear and trembling. I mean, and the fear and the trembling comes from the fact that God's holy and just. Sin is bad. God's holy and just. Sin, again, is bad. I just re repeated myself again. Oh, all right, that's two strikes against me for Craig. But, but God is holy. Sin is bad. And so I have to work out my salvation with this recognition that He's holy. He demands perfection. So, so there is this reverential awe and fear that we should have toward God. He's not just our buddy. 
He loves us. He's closer than a brother. But he's not just our partner, our pal, right? He's our God. He's holy and just. And I think oftentimes we, we I mean, I guess this, we can be too, too serious sometimes. And um, I, I guess that's, that's possible. I don't have that problem. Or we can be too lax. That's kind of where I tend to struggle. We can take God too lightly sometimes. And, and again, we have to remember that He is our God. He's holy and He's just. Yes, He's closer than a brother, but when we come to Him, we realize that we're working out our salvation in light of who He is. Not working for. That's a very, very distinctive way of saying things. Work out, not work for. Amen? You don't earn your salvation, but you work it out. Why? Because He's in us. He's within us, causing us to will and to work for His good pleasure. So God's at work inside of us, and we respond accordingly. This is spiritual growth. And this should happen every day of the week and twice on Sundays, right? It should just happen every day of the week. It should happen throughout the day, every day of the week. Amen? Amen. Constantly, we're, we're being reminded, oh, I'm a sin. Father, forgive me. I mean, it, and in some situations, it may be that simple. You may verbalize it, but you may just think it, wow, I can't believe I just said that. Father, forgive me. I'm so sorry, Lord. I, I, I renounce my sin. And, and then, you know, you start singing a psalm, a, a hymn, a spiritual song like Brandon talked about a couple Sundays ago, right? Out of, is that, that's Colossians. That's the Colossians chapter. Um, it talks about being filled with the Spirit. And you know that by exhibiting that kind of fruit, that good things come out of your mouth. I mean, that's, that's part of it. But, but, <clears throat> but, but we have to be working at it. So here's an example for us to follow. Let's finish up with this, this example. And this, this passage will be familiar. 2 <clears throat> Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. We, several sermons here in the last month have kind of centered around part of this teaching. Some of our Wednesday night Bible studies, we've looked at this as we've talked about God's Word and what it's good for. It's good for life and godliness. But he says, All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Why? So that the man of God may be adequate. That word adequate means thoroughly equipped. So adequate, thoroughly equipped for every good work. It's not just like, ah, it's adequate. We'll get by. It, again, it means thoroughly equipped. It's the word artios. It's what our school here used to be called, artios. We want to thoroughly equip kids to live out their Christian life in this world. That's the goal. Now it's called kapha because artios, we, we did away with the uh, lic licensing there. But, but anyway, here, here's the point. This is how this works out practically. As we are working through these stages, ourselves or with someone that we care about, trying to help them, a brother or sister at in Christ, someone, a friend from church or from work or whatever it might be. We want to help them spiritually through this. So there's this teaching phase. People can't fix what they don't know is wrong. So part of the teaching phase is to help people see what they're doing is actually sinful. All right? And so the teaching phase, you have <clears throat> the Holy Spirit is guiding and convicting. Uh, the Holy Spirit enlightens your mind through the Word of God, the body of Christ, circumstances, and through prayer. All of these things happen. And this is really where the realization kind of part takes place that we talked about earlier. The realization, they come to realize, you know what, that was sinful. That was wrong. And this is how, because we're helping them, we're teaching them. And there's several scriptures that we can look at, like in uh, John 16, verses 8 through 13. And He, when He comes, the He is the Holy Spirit here. Jesus is telling His disciples... When the Holy Spirit comes, He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin because they do not believe in Me and concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you no longer see Me. And concerning judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. The ruler of this world is Satan. Satan's been judged already. <laughs> Amen? And he's, he's on a leash now. God's in control. There's only one sovereign. Satan is not the yang to God's yin, so to speak, in duality, dualism, Taoism or Taoism, you know, um, Buddhism, all the kind of Eastern myth, myth, mystic, mystical kind of religions. He's not the equal. He's powerful as an angel, but he's not as powerful as God. He's not God's co-equal. He's on a leash, but it's long. Well, let's just be real. The leash is long. The devil has free reign right now in this world. Um, he can do just about whatever he wants to with God's permission. Remember Job? What did, devil, what did the devil have to do? He had to go to God to ask permission to do stuff to Job. And God held Job up. That's, a right, that's, that's, my righteous, that's my righteous child, Job. You can do anything but, you know, take his life. That was, that was kind of the parameters. And Satan did. Satan took everything from him. And Job waffled a bit, but he was righteous. 
the Lord supported him, and he praised God in the midst of those storms. There's some beautiful passages. Um, not, not too terribly long ago, I used the passage out of there for a funeral that, that I was able to, to, to preach. There's just some good, good stuff there that came from the struggles, but people have to be taught. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. Verse 12, Jesus says, I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you in all truth, for He will not speak on His own initiative, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will disclose to you what is to come. Can I just throw this in there real quick? The Holy Spirit is not here to put on the Holy Spirit show. And a lot of our churches today, that's, that's all they try to do. Um, all the attention's on the Spirit, the Spirit, the Spirit, the Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost. And, um, and usually in those circles, they like the term Holy Ghost better than Holy Spirit. It just has, I don't know, I don't know why they like it, but um, it doesn't even matter what I think why. I don't know why they do it, but they do it. But the Holy Spirit's role is never to promote Himself, not itself, Himself. The Holy Spirit is the third person of our triune Godhead. Amen? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's role is always to point people to Jesus. That's the role of the Spirit. It's always about Christ. It's always about Christ. And so just tuck that away for, for such a time as you may need it. But he says, he goes on to say in verse, <clears throat> verse 9 here, he says, But just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love Him. For to us, God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the Spirit of the man, which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. Now, we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit of He who is from God, so that we, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. For the Word of God is living. and Oh, I went on to Hebrews. I'm sorry. Well, let's go ahead. Look at Hebrews. Hebrews 4.12. The Word of God is what? It's living. <clears throat> it's active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And that's the same idea that we're talking about here in, um, in John chapter 16. It's the Spirit that convicts us. And so people need to be taught what that is, what that means, how that happens. The Holy Spirit does convict the lost. Nobody would be saved apart from that. Amen? I mean, the Holy Spirit is involved in uh, that aspect with the lost. But for Christians, the Holy Spirit is in us. In us. 24-7. You can't go anywhere. You can't climb a mountain high enough to get away from the Holy Spirit. You can't go to the deepest place in the ocean to get away from the Holy Spirit. He's everywhere. He's everywhere. Uh, sorry, that's my old... Uh, what's that guy's name? Ray Stevens? Sorry, I just couldn't help myself. Y'all remember Ray Stevens? So, some... Any, okay, all right. Uh, oh, yes, they call him the... What was it? Green. Yeah, why are y'all talking about that? That's, you shouldn't be talking about that in church. Um, okay, I baited you. My apologies. But the Holy Spirit is in us. And everywhere we go, thank God, amen, Thank God for that. And so He does. He convicts us and empowers us so that we can have the mind of Christ. But the teaching, the teaching has to happen. And so people need to see what they're doing is sinful. They need to see how to overcome it through the Word of God by the power of the Holy Spirit. Just jot down 1 John 4, verses 4 through 6. And then um, 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13. In fact, just think about this one. Because I, I know um, if you're breathing, you've probably experienced this. And if you haven't yet, I think you probably, you likely will at some point. We, we oftentimes kind of get into this trap. It says in verse 12, 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of His glory, you may rejoice with exultation. You ever sometimes just kind of get stuck and think, why in the world am I going through this? It's an opportunity to glorify God. I mean, to be taught, obviously, to learn things. Now, I don't know about you, but those kind of lessons, Sabrina, I want to learn them fast. And I usually don't. Do you? I want to learn them fast. I'm my own worst enemy sometimes. I'm slow, so slow to hear at times. But Revelation chapter 8, verses 28, excuse me, 26 and 27 also talks about how the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't know what to pray. The Spirit can pray for us. That's not a prayer language. 
It doesn't involve your language at all, actually. It doesn't involve your tongue, your lips at all. It's the Spirit praying on our behalf. So he prays for us with groanings too deep for words. And he, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. That's, that's so comforting. Not only is the Spirit interceding for us, but you know, Jesus is interceding for us. That's wonderful. You know, Satan still has access to the Father right now. You realize that? We've talked about that, I think. But Satan still has access to heaven. He has not been cast out of heaven permanently yet. That day will come. Uh, that day's coming uh, at a certain point during the tribulation period. It will happen. And, and then literally all hell will break loose upon this world. You don't want to be here for that. You don't, you don't want for anyone to be here for that. But until that point in time, he still is able to be the accuser of the brethren. And so he goes before the Father accusing us. But guess who our high priest and our defense attorney is? It's Jesus who defends us against the, the fiery darts of Satan. Praise God for that. I think we forget that sometimes when we're going through stuff. It's been filtered through God. It's been filtered through God. So please don't forget that, whatever it might be. So, um, so the teaching phase, that's part of the spiritual growth. We have to be taught. Secondly, the conviction phase. We're almost done here. The conviction phase. And this is that reproof that we were talking about earlier. Right? The Word of God is useful for teaching, for reproof. But the conviction, I mean, there, this lines up with those, those phases we were talking about earlier. We have to be reproved so that we'll be convicted. God begins to focus our attention in a particular area of life, convincing us that change is necessary. So we have this realization and remorse. So going back to those other things we talked about, that's what's happening here. It's like in Philippians chapter 3. Verse 14 and verse 15. Philippians 3, verse 14 and verse 15. What does Paul say? I press on toward the goal to win the prize. In, uh, the prize of, uh, 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 of the upward call of God, sorry, uh, in Christ Jesus. That's, what, that's, what, that's what's happening here. We're, we're pushing on for that. He says, let us therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. Now, we just said no one's perfect. So what does this mean? What do you think that means right there? Let us, therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. And if anything, you have a different attitude. And if in anything, God will reveal that also to you. What do you think he's saying right there? Huh? It's the conviction idea. We're perfect in this situation, this matter. Nobody's perfectly sinless in this world. Not yet. One day in glory. But now we're, we're coming through this, this, this realization and this conviction. And so that's, that's what's in view here. Now, in 2 Corinthians 7, he says, For the sorrow, again, we've looked at this, the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. And so there's that conviction, that reproof stage. And so what's the Word of God do? So as we're, as we're being discipled, as we're growing spiritually, we're being taught about God and about sin, what God expects, what we should put on with God, what we should put off, how our thinking needs to change. We're being convicted of those areas. But thirdly, now is the correction stage. The Word of God is useful for teaching, reproof, correction. So you make a decision now. Now you're consciously involved. You make a decision to abandon the sin issue. You begin a new thought. That's the renewing your mind. A new thought, right? A new word, action. Trusting God's power to make things function accordingly. According to what? According to God's word, what He wants for us. If you are a Christian, you are not your own. As a Christian, I'm not my own. We've been bought with a price. Therefore, we're to glorify God in our bodies, right? That means, though I may want to do A, A is sin, I don't do it. I don't do it because it wouldn't be glorifying to God. Does that make sense? So it's not my will be done. It's your will be done, God. All of that's part of this, this, um, this stage here. <clears throat> and so you make this decision to abandon the sin. There's this correction that happens. Uh, another verse. Proverbs, write this down. Proverbs 28, verses 13 and 14. He who conceals his sin, his transgressions, will not prosper. But he who confesses and forsakes them will find compassion. How blessed is the man who fears always. But he who hardens his heart will fall into calamity. Now these proverbs, these, these witty sayings, these useful teachings, 
They're not necessarily guarantees that if I do A, then B happens. They're truisms, basically, is the way they're given. You know, something uh, a lot of them, Sol the Solomon gave um, a, a lot of these, right? These, am I saying that right, Solomon? Yeah. Um, but they're truisms. These are, these are generalities for the most part. But some of them are true, and some of them do speak to very core heart, heart issues. When we fear God, right, that's a good thing. We're blessed when we fear God. That doesn't mean we're blessed with, with perfect health and, you know, ginormous bank accounts and all the fancy cars and homes that we want and vacationing all over the world. That's not what that means necessarily. We're blessed in God. I mean, think about it. The riches that are ours because of Christ. We're in Christ. We're blessed. We won't face judgment. We don't face eternity separated from God. You can't get more blessed than that. I mean, that's the best blessed that there is. The best blessed that there is. Yeah, make sure I said that right. Okay, write that down. That sounds good too. I'm going to use that later. Blessed. The best blessed. Not really. Just kidding. But this is, this is what God gives us. And so we see this in, in Proverbs. We don't want to conceal our sin. Have you been guilty of that before? I mean, you're sinning. You know you're sinning. You don't want anyone else to know you're sinning. Anybody? Yeah. 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 Even my mother. Whoa. That, that's, all, that's humanity. That's not an excuse for us to sin, right? But that's, 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 that's base humanity in our sinful estate. But now, praise God, we're not in our sinful estate, are we? That does not have to be true of us any longer. We're able to put off, renew, put on holiness. That's what God's equipped us to do. Now, let me finish this up. So that's the, the correction stage. Finally, look down at this last thing, the training stage. Again, it's not as simple as I dream of genie. You know, fold your arms, do your head, and it's all fixed. Yeah, I wish it were that simple, Pam. I do. I wish it was like that. It's not. This is a constant battle. And sometimes, I mean, eventually it gets easier. I mean, right? It does get easier, but it's a battle. And there may be, be times, and, and here, look, I'll just be very transparent with you right now. When I feel really bad... I mean, when I'm just struggling and, and, and when it's hard to even like get up and get going, that's when, that's when my temptation is the strongest. I'm just going to be honest with you. That's when I want to sin the greatest, when I feel so bad. And, and, and I don't know why, but it, it just, it's difficult for me to have my mind in the right place. So I have to fight that constantly. But see, here's, here's the beauty. Because of Christ in me, the hope of glory, because I've been indwelt by the Holy Spirit, I know that's a problem in area for me. I know that's a problem. And so I'm able be. Not in my power, but because of the Holy Spirit in me, I'm able to recognize that and to start doing something about it early. Used to, it would just sneak up on me and get me. But we're growing in holiness. All of us are growing in holiness. Amen? Amen. We're supposed to be. Amen? Amen? All right. Good, good, good. So this training stage. Uh, as we're responding to God's conviction, we're seeking to put into practice what God's Word commands us to do. Folks, this is just every day for us as Christians. And so you may be sitting there thinking, this sounds so basic. What does this have to do with helping somebody? Because everybody is struggling with sin. Everyone's had some sin done against them or everyone's sinned against someone. And some way or another, it's affecting their life and the lives of those around them. Amen? I mean, that's just, that's constant. It's constant. If, if you're married, <laughs> it's twice as likely to be happening in your home. If you have kids, it's exponentially more likely for it to happen. If you're, if you're alone, you're more blessed in this area because it's just you and God. And you don't, have, you don't have the struggle of the other relationships so much. Now, it's not good to be alone all the time either. I'm not, I'm not saying that. But in, in these situations, the relationships are where the sinful, where our sin really tends to come out. Um... We'll talk more about that maybe next week. But, but, but here, here's the reality. What happens for us as we, as we go through these phases, as, as we come, as we're taught what sin is, who God is, as we're convicted, as the correction happens, as we begin training now, we're putting off, we're renewing our mind, we're putting on. Now, A, <clears throat> I'm able now by the power of God to start walking in holiness. I'm walking in holiness. So I'm walking in harmony with God and His Word and what He expects. I need to be taught that. If I don't read God's Word or someone's not teaching me God's Word, I don't know what He expects. So Christian, if you're not in God's Word, get in God's Word. If you're not in God's Word, you're anemic at best. 
But if you continually stay out, that speaks to a very, very um, serious condition with your heart. I would read 1 John and then question, have I truly been saved? I'm not trying to make you doubt your salvation, but, but I mean, Christians crave God's Word. Amen? We should. And I know we go through seasons where we don't. I, I get that. It happens to everybody. It even happens to preachers. I, I get that. But if you do not want God's Word, there's, there's a problem. But by the power of God, we're walking in harmony. We're, we're reading His Word. We're seeing things. And, and then secondly, we're experiencing victory now in our life. We have deeper fellowship. I, 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 just, I can't tell you, and, 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 and there, there's no boasting in, in, intended here, but just when, when I'm having those, those and this, this first part you'll understand why, when I'm having those days when, when and, and again, usually it's when my health is really plaguing on me and, and, and I get in my head about it and, 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 and I struggle to have my mind in the right place, when, when that's happening, when, when God's Spirit breaks through, and a lot of times it's through the help of someone, and, and it, may be, um, it may be Craig just popping in and yelling through the window, open the door and put on the coffee or whatever it was he was yelling. It may be something that simple, and you're like, oh, thank you, God. Thank you, God. And it just helps you to get your mind back to where it needs to be. It, it, it could be someone calling you, or like this week, Chris, um, uh, Chris Wagner just sent me a text in a moment when I just needed to, just a little boost just need a little boost. You know, I'm just, I had been through a really hard struggle Thursday. Well, actually, Monday through Thursday. Woke up after getting some, some um, new meds and woke up sometime late Friday. I slept a long time. It was glorious. It was great. I mean, I slept a long time. Most of Thursday and a good, good chunk of Friday, too. Uh, so I obviously need it. But, 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 but coming out of all, just that funk and now I'm trying to prepare for Sunday. And, and let me just, here, since I'm being so transparent right now, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm going to preach about church elders. People are going to be sleeping. They're going to be so bored. They're going to think, what does this have to do with me? What does this have to do with me? And so I'm just, I mean, laboring. Lord, you know, where's the application? How is this going to help the church? And, and I mean, all the way up through yesterday, I was rewriting and rewriting. And, and you think it was long this morning, and it was. It was going to be twice as long. But we're, again, we're going to put that back to next week. We're going to talk about, again, deaconing and deacon and serving and all of those things. How all of us serve and minister too. We're going to talk about both of those things next week. But I was just laboring over those things. And Chris, at just the right time, hey, I just want to check on you. How you doing? God put you on my heart. I mean, something that simple. And it just turns your mind back. So God uses people to help us to grow, to experience this victory, this deeper fellowship with God and with people around us in His church. And thank God for that, amen? We don't have to go through life, you know, alone. No man is an island. I know um, some of us in our situations, you, you are possibly, you know, single right now. But that doesn't mean you're alone. That doesn't mean you're alone. There are people here who maybe we need a reminder that, that people need us, amen? Amen? You may think about people who, who maybe even right now you're thinking, you know what? Shane, can I pick on you for a second? Yeah. You know, Shane, you're single, right? Yep. You're not like secretly, you know, in a relationship that you haven't told us? Okay, all right. So, so Shane Trotty, ladies and gentlemen. Um, how old are you, Shane? Four, 50? 54. Shane is 54, weighing in at ladies. Uh, he, no, he likes long walks on the beach. I'm just, I'm just kidding. That's really old. I'm so sorry. So sorry, Shane. But now I've, I've dug a hole and I can't, I can't remember how to get out, get out of it. Maybe I should just move on. But... But for the rest of us who, who say are married, we have, we have our family here. Shane's got family. He's got a son. He's got a grandson. But they're not here. Just using Shane as an example, maybe we need to think about Shane more often, the rest of us. You know, Maybe we need to think about, about the women in our church who are single. Or the other men, too. Maybe the, 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 the widows, the widowers. We need to be thinking constantly and, and if, if we're growing in holiness with the Lord, guess what will be happening? We will be doing these things. It'll be increasing exponentially. And that's good for the whole body. Amen? Amen? This is what we're striving to do. This will help the church. This isn't just how to, you know, uh, I'm going to fix all of my people, all my coworkers, because they drive me crazy. That's not, that's not what this is intended to do. That may be the byproduct, but this is for the church, how we truly help one another biblically, giving good advice. 
It's more than just platitudes. It's not just walking by and going, hey, I'm praying for you as you move on. And then you get home and you have no remembrance of what you're supposed to even be praying for. That's happened. I've done that. Have you done that? Yeah. Totally out of, out of your mind. And then you're too embarrassed to text them or call them and say, hey, what was that I was supposed to be praying for you about? You just kind of let it go. That's not helpful for you or them or anybody else. But we're intentionally, seriously thinking about how can I invest in someone to help them to be more like Jesus. That's discipleship. Growing together. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time that we've had tonight. As we, as we simply look at some practical ways that we can be there for each other. How we can really invest in one another. Lord, I, I pray that, that these messages for, for all of us, Lord, as, as you are bringing us to these places, that, that it will fall on, on soft hearts moldable, teachable hearts that we will have ears to hear and eyes to see how, how, how we can improve. Not thinking about what someone should do for us, but how, how, Lord, how I can be better at one anothering someone. I'm walking beside someone. And Father, I'm, I'm just so eager, so excited. I, I just pray for that day when we begin to see the fruit of, of, of all of these things happening as more and more of our church family is actively one anothering in this way. I can't wait to see what you're going to do with us, to us, and through us, Lord God. I'm, I'm eager, Father. So I, I just pray to that end. Convict us of our sin. Help us to put off, to change our thinking about our sin, and to put on holy habits. We ask this in Christ Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, folks. I... I, I, I um, I went over a little bit there again tonight. I kind of gotten into that habit, I guess, the last 10 years. <laughs> it's over. Hallelujah, he says. That's awesome. That's awesome. I bet your mama told you to say that, huh? Where is she? No, I'm just kidding. She's like, no. What's that? What? That's really <laughs> It's over. He finally stopped talking. I get it. I get it. I, I get tired of listening to myself sometimes, so y'all must really be struggling. Really be struggling. But, but just be thinking, thinking this week about how we can do these things. And, and I'm going to get this online. Becky, remind me. I want to get the notes for the last two sessions. And um, just also for, for the people that are at home. I know there's several folks who were supposed to be here, but they've, they've got some health issues. Um, so I'll make sure I get the handouts and the notes. In fact, probably just put the, the full notes on there to make it easier. And then when we're done, when we get through this kind of basic training, I mean, we are going to make a... a like a textbook for you, a little help book, a manual that you'll have, and it'll have other stuff in it too, like go-to passages of, you know, when someone's dealing with anger, when someone's dealing with, you know, pornography or, or whatever it might be, certain places where you can go to start as you help your friend, to help them realize their sin and walk them through some of these phases. I think it'll be real helpful for us. And, and like I prayed, I, I am really excited about what God's doing. Um, I think that we have laid some groundwork, not perfectly, I think we're fine-tuning, and I think things are, 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 I think we're gaining some traction. Um, I, I'm just very eager to see what God's fixing to do. I don't know what it is. I'm not going to name it and claim it, but, but I know that He's faithful, amen? And I think that, that if we would just be faithful, obviously God will be glorified, and that's what we're most wanting. We'll be edified and sanctified, and that's good also. But I, I think that we're going to be positioned to be able to minister better to more folks somehow, some way. And, and, and I don't know, my, my heart's really been, been struggling with a few specific things. Some, some are old things that maybe we've talked about in the past, about some kind of home here um, for those who are battling addictions, uh, some live in place. But there's some other areas that I, I, I've just really been broken over for some of the kiddos in our circles that have been hurt and uh, I don't know. I just want you to be praying about those kind of areas. What, what God could do with us. And uh, I, I jokingly, I think that was two weeks ago, jokingly said, you know, we can make $2 million off of a cemetery if we just used a little bit of this land. Uh, may, maybe that's something the church should consider. Well, let's just think about how could we be positioned to, to really make an impact while we have time. And, and may, maybe it's because, you know, I've been, been so sick and, you know, and... and, and the, the news, you know, here of late with, with the other struggles that some of this Lyme stuff has led to, uh, maybe it's just got, got me thinking, how can we be more impactful in a, in a quicker time? I, I don't know. But, but I like it. Whatever it is, 
I like it. I'm eager to see uh, what God will do if we will allow Him the freedom uh, to use us. Amen? So please be praying with me about that. Anything else? I know I'm still talking, and y'all are thinking, man, I thought he said amen 10 minutes ago. He did, <laughs> but he's talking, and he, he just can't stop. Have you stopped the camera at least? Okay, all right. Hey, you people out there, I'm done.